Thank you so much, Martha, once again, and thanks for having me here on Media X uh, event. It's always a pleasure to be here. I was there in one of the previous events, too, talking about people and personalities uh, and creating computational models with people's uh, um, data. So today I'll talk about a different topic. Uh, hopefully you'll find it interesting and uh, relevant to this particular event that's happening today. Um, this is a hot topic. Ha everybody in the industry who is doing anything with AI is concerned with this topic. How do we deal with errors that AI models make, the biases that they, that they exhibit, and uh, how do we make these AI systems more explainable and transparent, and how do we test these AI systems? Um, and uh, today I'll focus more on when I I'm using AI systems and machine learning models interchangeably, but I know there are you know, the differences. For the time being, for the purposes of this talk, let's treat them as uh, synonymous. Uh, so I'm, for the most part, I'm referring to actually machine learning models. Um, just so I understand, how many of you are computer scientists in this uh, forum? Okay, a few of you. And I assume the rest of you are, have very interdisciplinary background in different fields. Okay, so I will keep it to very high level and not go too much into technical aspects of it, but I'll try to convey the gist of what, um, um, what are some of the techniques that we are, we, we, we are thinking about and um, uh, what can we do to address some of these issues around uh, errors, biases that AI systems bring to the table. But before we go on, let me first explain, or at least level set from uh, in my vocabulary when I talk about AI systems, what is it that I'm talking about? If you uh, have ever uh, interacted with a, an automated IVR, uh, interactive voice uh, assistant type of things when you made a phone call to customer assistance, you know, that's a, that's a very rudimentary form of a, a system, right? Uh, the speech recognition system where based on what you say, say option one, option two, three, and say directions and these types of things, very narrow command control type of things, you're interacting with a bot on the other side. It's trying to recognize your voice and based on that, direct you accordingly or route your request accordingly. So that was, the, that was a pri primitive, you could say, rudimentary AI system that was you know, put in place back in late 70s, 80s. These days, you probably have, are seeing more and more of these chat bots or bots that are being deployed by companies, specifically in call center type of domains. And these bots are starting to interact with humans in trying to answer their questions, right? You ask them, call them with a password problem, and some of the more routine type of things that can be automated are, are being automated with these types of bots. So that's what an example of an AI system. Basically, what it's doing behind the scenes is it takes the voice or the chat text that you are typing in and is trying to understand the intent from it. So from the text that you type in, recognizing the words and the sequence of words, and uh, from that, trying to map it to a known intent. And from that mapped known intent, the system will try to then find the right response for you, right? So that's one example. A chat bot is an example of an AI system. Uh, and a more advanced type of AI systems are being deployed in healthcare um, in, as doctor's assistants, uh, where these, these systems read, read as in parse large amounts of medical content or papers synthesize that information and, and put the patterns together on what treatments worked for what patients with what kind of background uh, and so on and provide that kind of information to doctors in various other uh, remote parts of the world who can have access to the best um, you know, medical treatment options that the best of the best doctors in advanced countries are recommending and using and have known to have worked. So that's another example. Legal assistant in other, is another domain where um, for attorneys, um, you know, these bots are able to go, again, parse large amounts of legal document data, synthesize it, and quickly tell you which law, which rule applies, and which particular case was won when, cited by, when they cited which particular law, and so on, right? So, and social media monitoring. This is a very well-known example where um, uh, all the, the social media data, be it uh, images, uh, textual data that's been submitted, by users onto social media platforms is being analyzed to more personalize the interactions for people and so on. And when you walk into some of the more advanced airports these days, you pass through face recognition systems perhaps and, and so on. So those are also examples of AI systems. 
So these are all AI systems that are more and more becoming prominent in our day-to-day -day lives and in our businesses and in our um, you know, day-to-day -day interactions. So, but these are susceptible to a lot of problems um, because these are not traditional type of software, right? In a traditional software, you write, you have the exact requirements and you take those requirements and you write code and you test it exactly to match those requirements and each test case embodies exactly what a particular piece of software is meant to do. It either works or it doesn't work. So the test either passes or fails. Whereas in the case of AI systems, because these are, they tend to be mostly probabilistic um, and they tend to learn from data, um, they're not usually 100% accurate or at least not accurate in the first instance of their deployment. And as a result, you know, there is a, uh, there is a margin of error where they, they make mistakes in their predictions. So that's where all sorts of, you know, these interesting tissues, issues start coming in. So before we start, I, I kind of uh, get into what, what are the issues with um, biases and so on. I want to kind of give you a, a very quick overview of what machine learning models, how they are built and what is the pipeline like. Because it's very important to understand the pipeline of a, a machine learning model in order to understand what all places in the pipeline we could potentially introduce these undesirable biases or errors even without our own knowledge. So it's important to understand that. So let me uh, give a, a quick overview. So many of these machine learning services need to be taught. So they learn from data. So um, data is really the fuel, algorithms are the engine. So the typical example that everybody gives is this one where you are, you're trying to teach the system to classify dogs, cats and dogs accurately, right? So the way you do this is by collecting a large amounts of cat pictures and large amounts of dog pictures, label them that this is a picture of a cat, this is a picture of a dog, and let the system take those lab that labeled data and it will learn the patterns from it and it says, okay, I graduated, now I can start making predictions and you, you, you check the accuracy on a set of test cases by giving it some cat pictures, some dog pictures, and based on how good it is, if you say if it's, it's close to 90% accurate on you know, a given 100 images and 90% of the time it's right, then you say, okay, it's good enough for me, I, you'll deploy it in, as a you know, solution in some, some domain. Typically, that's how it works. And when I talk about AI, there could be structured data, there could be unstructured data. Unstructured data being text, your uh, natural language, speech, or images, or very structured data as in the data that sits in databases, right? So the traditional analytics field has looked at the structured data and has built prediction models using that. So for example, you know, your age, gender, salary, and all of this information is typically used in an analytical model to determine whether you are you know, worthy of a loan or not. Those kind of analytical models have existed for, for a long time, and even they are susceptible for biases and so on. Um, so my current talk today doesn't necessarily exclude those things, but I also want to bring in this whole different world of um, AI where there is all this unstructured data from which we are now building models, right? This, we are collecting natural language text, we are collecting speech samples, audio samples, we are collecting images and videos, and we are adding all of these as data from which we are, we are trying to learn and understand you know, what are the names of people being mentioned, what products are mentioned, what, what the, most of the complaints are about, um, and what is the intent being spoken, and so on. So there is this whole new world of data that now got added to this whole analytics world and AI applications that are being built, and we have to be aware and cognizant of that, um, these new types of data that are being added. And typically, the set of building block enablers uh, type of services that deal with that unstructured type of data are these, the speech to text, text to speech recognition systems, the natural language understanding systems, which, which tend to basically on a given piece of text try to understand um, who the, the people are, what are the mentions of organizations, locations, geographical features, and those types of things, and um, uh, what are the dates, numbers associated with particular things, and what is the sentiment, what is the emotions, what are the communication tones associated with um, a specific entity in a, in a given piece of text, and what is the personality of the person who wrote that text, uh, and so on and so forth. So there is a whole set of things, analytical modules that are being built, which become the enablers or the building blocks for building all those kinds of chatbots, 
and face recognition solutions, doctor's assistance, and social media monitoring solutions, all those things that I talked about at the beginning are built using these underlying building block services, typically. Now the question is, now if these building block services are biased inherently, whether by, by design or by, um, you know, uh, uh, not by design, uh, the applications that are built using these building block services will have, will carry those biases as well, uh, and those errors as well. So it's very important to understand, that's why, what are the ingredients with which you are building or baking your cake, right? Um, so here is the process. The process is also very important. It's not only the ingredients that could create, um, that could result in biases and problems, it is also the process by which you build it, right? So this is a, a representation, pictorial representation of a, a machine learning life cycle, if you will. And I say life cycle because it's really a very iterative process. It never end, starts and ends in one, circ, one cycle. It's, it's uh, because the system needs to continuously improve over time in order to get to the levels of accuracy that it needs to get to. Um, so the typical process starts with, um, I hope I can point it here. Yeah, typical process, this is the process. You collect data to train a system. Then you prepare features, what are called the main things upon which you will learn. Um, then the, the, and the actually train a model, you test it, you benchmark it to make sure it's of good quality, you deploy it, and then you see what mistakes it makes and, it'll con and it needs to continuously learn. That means it may need to go get more data um, and, and go through the same cycle again to iterate. And each step in itself is a very iterative process. So the data collection process um, typically done, is done by a data lead involves you know, either crawling the data, collecting the data from different vendors, acquiring it with licensed data, cleaning it, annotate it or label it by asking humans um, to label it. And humans are an integral part of uh, preparing data for teaching AI systems. Then you analyze it to make sure you have right amount of data in right proportions and all of that. And once the data is ready, you prepare features. And the feature preparation could be if it is text, you have to break it down into words, and that, that typically those words carry a lot of importance, and that's, those, that's called the tokenization process, or you do the segmentation of the sentences into segment, sentence boundaries, part of speech, tag it, and so on and so forth. So there are a whole set of uh, things. And in the case of model training, it's about the choice of the algorithm. Am I going to write some rules in order to uh, represent the the, the patterns that are in this data in order to build a model, or am I going to let a machine learning model discover those patterns by itself? And if so, which algorithm would I use? And what configurations of the parameters of the algorithms would I use? These are all decisions that a data scientist would make in, in building a, in a model. And then an engineer will come deploy it after testing it, and the testing team really tests it, tests it on a whole bunch of data sets to make sure that it works and it's it's fully covering the, the areas that you want the model to do well in. So if you look at it, there are humans involved everywhere in the process, obviously, but very importantly, you know, there could be in this annotation labeling process, there are a lot of crowd platforms that typically many of uh, these companies were building AI models tend to leverage these days. So you basically, you, you, you take the, the data that you have, be it images or, um, textual sentences that you may have created, or audio samples that you have collected, and you send it to crowd workers and ask them to either specifically label, is this a picture of a cat or a dog, or is this, um, does this sentence um, sound like a positive sentiment sentence to you or a negative sentence sentiment to you? And um, uh, you ask, given a sentence, label the names of uh, all geographic locations that occurred in this so that you can train an entity recognition system. So humans play a huge part, and by nature, humans um, you know, bring their own um, biases, and known and unknown, and uh, that creeps into the labeling process. What might be a positive sentiment could be a neutral sentiment to another person. So this creates an interesting set of dynamics in, in the noise that gets introduced in data that confuses the model often. So anyway, keep that in mind. So now we come to understanding what these biases mean. So bias in an AI model is, uh, you know, it's a, according to the definition, you could say it's a perceivable prejudice, right, in, in the prediction um, outcomes of an AI model, either in favor or against a specific set of attributes. Um, but in general, not, bias by itself is not bad because 
you know, in the statistical definition of the world, data has to have certain amount of bias in order for the model to actually learn the patterns. If everything is homogeneous, then really there is not that much to do and learn different kind of patterns uh, on to classify. So when, whenever we say bias in an AI model, we are typically talking about undesirable bias. So the question is, how do you define an undesirable bias? Let's say, we'll come to that, but let's say somehow you defined an undesirable bias, right? How do you measure it? Um, and um, what, how many, what are the types of biases and where can they be introduced in the whole pipeline that I talked about? It's very important to understand the people involved in it and the pipeline steps and to understand where in the process this whole thing is getting introduced and um, how am I going to mit mitigate it? And by the way, this whole AI system, is this explainable? When it makes a prediction, let's say you, know, you, you ask, you're using this in loan prediction and you, your loan got rejected. You have the right to ask why your loan got rejected, right? What if the model says, well, my loan got rejected because it's got a certain, you know, it makes a certain, it, it had a particular prediction score that is less than my threshold, therefore, it, you know, we didn't give you the loan, your loan got rejected. Is that explanation? It, ideally, you're looking for, um, you know, the fact that you, you know, your credit history in the past had such and such event that, uh, you know, was, uh, you know, problematic and therefore, you know, your loan is de de denied. And if you had that kind of explanation, at least you know why and uh, you could do something about it to improve your credit history or whatnot, right? Um, but um, depending on the type of algorithm you choose, you may not be able to actually explain why the model made whatever recommendation it made, whatever prediction it made, right? Because if it is a, a very deep neural network, which tends to operate like as a very opaque machinery where you give a whole bunch of data, labeled data, and it's like a black box and out comes the prediction. You have no idea why it made the prediction it made. You just have to trust the black magic inside that black box. Um, but, you know, there are two schools of thought for that, right? When you go to a doctor, uh, doc when, you, when you're sick, doctor gives you a medicine. Even the doctor himself or herself does not fully understand why that medicine actually works, right? Uh, our human body is so complex and everybody's particular genetic traits and DNA setup is so unique and, uh, and the kind of previous ailments you, a person had and the kind of current medicines that they are taking and how does this new drug that they are being prescribed interacts with everything else. It's such a complex system that it's very hard to know how ex exactly this medicine will work for that patient. And yet, the doctor prescribes it, the patient takes it, doesn't ask a question about it, and a lot of times it actually works. So one school of thought and one school of argument goes along those lines and say, well, if an AI system is not totally explainable, maybe it's okay, it's not the end of the world. Um, you can try to get some amount of explanation out of it by poking it by, after the fact, still treat it like a black box, ask it a lot of questions, and from the questions you're asking and the predictions it's making, kind of observe what is happening inside of it and based on that, try to explain it a little bit. That's what some of the techniques that are being proposed in the industry, uh, some of the algorithms are kind of trying to do. So it's almost like doctors assessing how patients react to those medicines and take those notes, and they exchange notes in medical conferences, conferences and they write papers about it. That's how you get to know what medicine interacts with what other medicines. It's always after the fact. It's not, uh, um, I mean, you try to predict it with the chemical compound interactions ahead of time, but still, the human body is too complex and you don't know if exactly that prediction model works for a particular patient or not, right? So the other school of thought is that, so, okay, all right, so I don't know how to, how to explain it, but I will accept it and I will, after the fact, poke it, poke it ask a lot of questions and I'll get some, some sense of how it's working. So that's something a little bit on explainability, not exactly talking to the slide here, but that's on explainability. Now, uh, the other school of thought goes, well, why even build black box systems that you cannot actually explain? Just build more transparent AI systems in the first place. And the way to do that is, you know, go back to the old school of um, really examining the data carefully and capture those patterns as rules that a human would write. And if you actually capture enough of those rules, 
um, then each of those rules will raise their hand and with enough confidence at a particular point in time. And you take the one that makes the most confidence and if the model is making mistakes, you go back and change those rules. So roughly that's how the model works. That's another school of thought. So it's about ex being very explainable or be black box, but there are multiple schools of thought emerging in this area. So coming back to biases in AI systems, you, you all may have heard of this New York Times uh, article that kind of got blown up out of proportions uh, for a good reason maybe, that um, talked based on a research paper that talked about how the image recognition systems by most of the vendors out there, uh, all big companies, did not do a good job of recognizing African American women's faces. So this was done on, uh, um, I think Senegalese um, uh, parliamentarians, it could not recognize their fa women's faces especially very well, and it was cla uh, classifying them incorrectly all the time. Um, and so it was recognized, noted as a bias in the, in the, in the image recognition systems, and it created a, at a huge uh, um, uh, you know, discussion and debate online um, and in conference circles on what to do about you know, biases in AI systems and such. So here we talk about you know, a few techniques, practical uh, suggestions and tips for how to avoid this uh, type of biases. So first, as I talked about, understand where biases may come from. Biases may come from data or features, if you go back to the pipeline that I had shown, or in the model itself. In the data, it could come in training data or testing data. In the case of training data, it could be how, what are the sources of data that you went to. In the case of parliamentarians not being recognized, if you only went to um, parliamentarians in, in countries where um, Caucasians are a majority, obviously your training data is biased because it did not see enough instances of uh, African American women, right? So it's important to understand the sources of data, where you're getting the data from, and then it's important to also make sure that the labels that were created by humans are unbiased. It, there could be sometimes biases creeping in there as well, and there needs to be a very good disciplined data science dis process and discipline that needs to be put in place to make sure that you know, training data is not biased either at the source or by at the labels. Sometimes you, you could actually get a good quality training data, but your test data set is testing something completely different than what the training data is about, which means that it's a mismatch between what what you want the model to do, which is being described in the test case, whereas what the model is being trained with is the training data, that whatever you got access to. And if these two are not aligned, then you know, the model will also misbehave, or it'll look like it's misbehaving, it's not working on the test data. In features, you could introduce it, depending on what kind of features you use, depending on you know, some poor quality tokenizers will chop off words, you know, uh, in a, uh, especially in languages where speech delimition is not a, uh, something that you can rely on and so on. It could introduce different kinds of problems in, in words appearing you know, in mid-character and, and so on, or sentences not being segmented properly. And sometimes, depending on the choice of the algorithms uh, or depending on the person who is actually building a rule, if they are biased or if they are ignoring certain aspects of uh, the patterns in order to capture the rule. So it could come anywhere. So I won't go too much into the detail. If you just look at the data pipeline itself, there is data collection, data selection. What type of data are you selecting after you collect in order to train? How are you labeling it? How are you enhancing it? And how are you, are you checking to make sure that the vendors who are supplying you the data is of high quality? Everywhere in the process, there could be biases that could be coming in. So similar to how they say garbage in, garbage out rule applies, bias in, bias out rules applies as well with data. So that's, uh, that's an important thing to keep in mind. So the next question is, how do you detect and how do you measure these undesirable biases? Right, so here are some best practices. So first thing is set goals. You know, start with test cases and ground truth. In the case of um, New York Times article with Senegalese um, women not being recognized, African-American women, if only there was a test set that had enough African-American women's images in them right at their their building time, they would have recognized that it's not doing a good job of it even before releasing it. But somewhere along the way, in the, whoever systems were built did not take that, set that as goal and did not include all of those test cases properly in the initial test case design. So I think a lot of it goes back to really setting goals properly, understanding what do you want this AI model to do well. And do, do that well. But at the same time, I understand that it may not be, you may not be able to under, uh, understand everything. Therefore, 
declare your biases, you know, tell openly, right, what you are trained, trained your AI system with, and therefore you, you know exactly, you know, what you are giving to others and others know what they are getting with it. Um, can you predefine uh, your bias attributes, you know, in the case of age, gender, race, geography kind of things, most people know how to predefine them. Whereas a uh, lot of unknown things pop up. You know, when we were building a sentiment model during the election time, every time Trump or um, Hillary was mentioned in the sentences, there were very strong positive or negative sentiments coming in. That doesn't mean that, you know, that's a, that particular point in time, just those names by themselves in, in a given sentence should not be triggering that type of biases. It's, it, there's a lot of more context to that that's triggering the biases. And if we trained our system with those, every time some other person named called Hillary doesn't ha have anything to do with Hillary Clinton or Trump may end up getting you know, penalized one way or the other, right? So those are the kind of unknown biases that the system would have to detect. And there are a set of debiasing techniques that uh, are being explored, but they really depend on the type of mistake or the error the system makes. Um, all right, so um, here is one example I will, you know, I will tell you, so quickly tell you some of the best practices. It's very important to perform error analysis. So clearly sit down with data. There is nothing like sitting with data and looking at the predictions and seeing what mistakes it's making. With a pen and a paper, classify them. And, and, um, and then you can build models from it to automatically classify the type of errors. Based on the type of errors the model is making, you can build a strategy for what, how to fix it. And the bias is one type of error. Right, Sl slice the data. So, you know, my training data, in, this is one example of uh, number of big words in a sentence. Um, it's broken down into, you know, you know 10 words, 15, uh, five words, you know, seven words, um, 10 words, 12 words in a sentence type of buckets. Um, this is one, one example, and this is not, um, you know, full final one, but you can clearly start to see wh where you train the model and where exactly, um, this is the actual payload as in the what came in and this is what was trained. Very little data in here and therefore it's not learnt well those patterns and therefore it's making mistakes. Um, so you can start to see these types of patterns if you start to slice the data and that's really not, no substitution to it. And another you know, example or a best practice that I would point out is that you have to quantify. So if this is my best test data set and this is my potentially biased data set, we are designing techniques to compare these two so that we can quantify and tell you how far away they are. So if there are specific type of you know, faces not represented, then we will be able to tell you and give you guidance saying, hey, if this is what you want to test it on, and, but this is what you are training, there is a problem, right? There is a delta that you have to fix. All right, so my key takeaways from this, there is a lot more, of course, but um, you know, AI models rarely get it right, the first iteration. You have to constantly keep on improving them. And the way to improve them is by clearly understanding the mistakes they make, and from those mistakes, classify and figure out the right strategy to go back and fix that. And, that, and it has to be an iterative process. Uh, and that's why the, that's the second point about be diligent with error analysis. And by the way, if it's it's always good to just be open and declarative about your biases. You know, sort of we talk about it like nutrition labels, so people know what they're getting, or the um, the the drug labels or ingredients in a drug, so you know what they're what you're getting, right? And I talked about this. You know, must you build really opaque models and then you know test and try to explain them later versus building more transparent models. Um, that may take more human effort, but that are more inherently explainable. But these are two schools of thought, and they both are emerging. And it may be not that this one versus the other, it may be the best of these two have to come together in order to build more practical AI systems that are explainable. Uh, and humans are a in very integral part of building these AI models, and their, you know, their personalities, their mistakes, their backgrounds, all of those things factor in, in into, into how, um, how, how they label and, and how they build a model. And you have to continuously you know, monitor the models for drift and misalignment. So what do I mean by drift? You train it with, with one goal in mind, and people are using it for another goal. And you take that data that you are getting and try to improve your model with that data. So as a result, even without you noticing, you're slowly changing the overall you know, model's goal by feeding in data from, from the real world. Is that what you want to do or not? You have to consciously make those decisions. So always constantly watch out for those misalignments. So what, what is happening in the industry is many of the vendors are now AI 
uh, platforms and AI system who are providing these AI services are after building all these analytics in their platforms. And that's, that's what you see more and more in, in the industry now, including IBM, Google, Microsoft, everybody are releasing these platforms that allow you to examine, monitor the health of the models in terms of biases, the explainability and all that, so that you can, when you integrate them into business processes, you can actually make more um, meaningful decisions and also know exactly what you're getting, what kind of model you're deploying into production and such. Mm -hmm.